Good evening. I want to hear you. Good evening. A passage this evening is the book of Psalms, Psalm 40. So I'll be turning and be reading the whole of Psalm 40 in your hearing from the ESV version, Psalm 40. To the, to the choir master, the Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of your book, of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O Lord, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you would not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evil has encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O oh Lord, to deliver me. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my heart. Let those be appalled who, because of their shame, who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Truly, our Father, we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And Lord, that is why we've gathered again this evening to proclaim that message that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. So, Lord, for all those who here do not know of Jesus, how we desire that you do a saving work today. And for those of us who know of Jesus, how we pray that you deepen our knowledge of this truth, that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. So, Lord, help us even as we study your book together and bless our time together and leave us help and make sure we live here rejoicing that truly Jesus saves and Jesus saves. Amen. All right, good evening, everyone. I love the Psalms. Anybody who knows me knows that for a fact. Indeed, I've preached more sermons on the Psalms than I have preached on any other book in the Bible. And as I love the Psalms, I want you to, to love the Psalms. So I want to give you three reasons tonight why you should love the Psalms as much as I do. The first reason why the Psalms are unique in the Bible is that the Bible is largely a book of instruction. We have God instructing us in the way of righteousness. But the Psalms are different. The Psalms are a book of response. They are man's response to God based on what man has learned about God. And because the Psalms are part of holy writ, it means that these responses are acceptable in the sight of God. And so, do you want to learn how to pray in a way that God accepts? Then read the Psalms 
and see how the psalmist poured out their hearts to God and then learn from them how to pray? Do you desire to learn how to sing to the Lord in a way that brings joy to the Lord and is faithful to his word? Then study the psalms and see how the psalmist sang to God and learn from them and you and I would learn to sing aright. So that's the first reason. The psalm is a book of response. The second reason why I love the psalms so much is that the psalms cover a wide range of emotions that cover the whole of the human existence. Most of the songs we sing these days are what I call happy clappy songs. That means the songs that make you sing, they have to make you clap, and they have to make you move from side to side. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a place for that. But what about days when I don't feel like singing, when I don't feel like clapping, when I don't feel like moving from side to side? The Psalms are not only full of happy songs. The Psalms are full of sad songs. The Psalms are not only full of songs of praise. The Psalms are full of songs of lament. The Psalms teach us what it means to come to God in the day when our lives seem to be falling apart. The days when you don't know what to say, the Psalms gives you word that you can bring to God. The Psalms are for all of your lives, not only when things are going well, but also especially in those days when things are not going well. And the third reason and the most important reason why I love the Psalms is that Jesus loved the Psalms and Jesus sang the Psalms. For example, in Matthew 26 verse 30, it says to us that Jesus and his disciples sang and him on the night he was going to the cross. So what hymn do you think they sang? Amazing Grace? No. The Psalms were the hymn book of the church in the Old Testament. And whenever they wanted to sing, they would pick a song from the psalm and they would sing the psalms. And so whenever you see that Jesus sang a hymn, it meant they sang the psalms. And so if Jesus would sing the psalms and would love the psalms and would lead his disciples in singing the psalms. It means you and I should be like the disciples of Jesus that we are and want to follow our master in singing the psalms. And so when you sing the psalms, you are singing with David, you are singing with Jesus, you are singing with the church in all ages and all times. I like the way one of the commentator writes about this. He says this, Christians who sing the psalms today join the same choir as the Israelites in the wilderness, festival congregations in Jerusalem, the apostles in their missionary adventures, the early martyrs, the church fathers, the reformers, and saints all through church history. The psalms are truly the universal songs of the whole church. And so, having given you those three reasons, I invite you to join me today as we go through Psalm 40 and we see the message that Psalm 40 has for us. And so we see the superscript of Psalm 40. It tells us two things. It tells us it is a psalm of David. That means David, the king of Israel, was the one who wrote this psalm. Out of his personal reflections and out of his personal experience, he penned this psalm down for our edification. But the second thing we see is that it says to the choir master, that means to the one who is in charge of public worship in Israel. So David wrote this psalm from his personal experience, but he intended it to be used for public worship. And so he's dedicated it to the choir master. So when the people of Israel gather together in worship of Yahweh God, then they would sing these songs and they would learn from David's experience and they would learn more about God and be led in a deeper knowledge of God. I've titled the sermon today, The Heart of a Pilgrim, because I think that in this psalm, David goes to the heart of what it means to be a pilgrim. So let me ask you, who is a pilgrim? Is a pilgrim someone who goes to Mecca or Jerusalem and comes back and puts JP after their name? Is that who a pilgrim is? No. A pilgrim is someone on a journey, on a journey searching for God. Being a pilgrim means knowing that all of life is a search for God, to know God more, to learn more of God, and to worship him the way he desires to be worshipped. And 
this is not something that is an Old Testament thing. Indeed, in the New Testament, the Apostle Peter says this. He says, Christians are sojourners and pilgrims, 1 Peter 2.11. And the writer of Hebrews says the same thing. He says, Christians are sojourners. So Peter calls Christians sojourners and pilgrims. The writer of Hebrews calls Christians strangers and pilgrims, Hebrews 11.13. And these are the writers of the New Testament. And they tell us that the Christian life, is the life of pilgrimage. Indeed, that's why you have that famous classic, John Boyan. He took it straight from the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, because the Christian life is a pilgrim journey through this world. And if we believe the New Testament writers, it means one of our principal aims must be to grow in our understanding of what it means to be a pilgrim, to walk through life as a pilgrim, to be constantly seeking God, to know more of him, and to keep looking for that city whose maker and builder is God. And so David writes this psalm as a pilgrim, teaching the people of Israel what it means to be a pilgrim, what it means to be searching for God, what it means to have an experiential knowledge of God, what it means to come to worship God and to sing a right to him. And verses 1 to 3 tells us the concrete situation in his life that gave a rise to this psalm. It tells us in verse 2, it says, it was in the pit of destruction. It tells us that it was in the mary bog. What does it mean? It's metaphorical language describing a very difficult situation. To help you imagine this, so imagine one evening you're walking along in your estate, and all of a sudden, you fall into a deep pit. And later, you find out that it was a man that was building his house that never finished it and had an uncompleted soccer way that you just fell into. Now, when you fall into that soccer way, what you realize when you get to the bottom of it is that it's going to be what? Rainy season in Nigeria was going to be in the bottom? Mud. And the more you try to get out of that pit, what will happen to you? The deeper you get into it. And you're going to, after you've struggled for about, 30 minutes, you are going to come to the realization that if I'm going to leave this pit, it is not because I'm going to save myself. The only way out of this pit is for someone outside from this pit to draw me out. And that is exactly what David is telling us. That he was in such a terrible situation in his life. And after struggling and getting deeper and deeper into the Mary bog, he realized that the only way out of that situation in his life was for him to cry to God that God would draw him out of that pit. And that is what he did. He says, he cried out to God. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. Why crying? It didn't come as quick as he wanted. But the Bible tells us, David tells us, I waited patiently for the Lord. And look at what Spurgeon said about this verse. Spurgeon says, brethren, might it not be read, I waited impatiently for the Lord, in the case of most of us, it is not enough to pray to God. What David is talking about here is trusting God. That after you have prayed, you trust that God would answer your prayer. And while you are waiting for God's answer, what do you do? You wait patiently for the Lord. And because God is a merciful God, David tells us in verse 2, God dream out of the pit. God heard his prayer and God drew David out of that terrible situation he is in. Remember, this is the public psalm. This is not David thanking God privately. This is David teaching the people of Israel from his experience, teaching them the lessons they should learn from his own situation. And so what is that lesson? That is what we find in verse 4 and 5. David tells us that blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. That means the lesson for David and the lesson for you and I is that the blessing of God does not rest on the man who prays or the man who comes to worship God. The blessing of God rests on the man who makes the Lord his trust. What does that mean? This is what it means in real life. Whenever you and I are going through life as pilgrims, there would always be the temptation to leave the path of waiting on God and to walk through the broad path of shortcuts. So think about every circumstance in your life. 
there's always the alternative between waiting on God, the slow, hard, frustrating effort of waiting for God to answer your prayer, or the fast route of waiting, of turning to another solution and looking for a short way. I think about this, something I found out in Abuja. Whenever you're in Abuja and you're driving and you wait at the traffic, like what happens to you? Everybody's just going, whew, whew, whew. and after a while you start to think, am I, is, does this light work? Or am I mad? Or why is everybody going? And that is the picture of the Christian life. In every circumstance you are in, there are going to be people just going past you. And the temptation is always, do I go with them? Or do I wait on God to answer my prayer? And David tells us, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, and who does not go astray after a lie. And that is one of the lessons David wants to teach us. But David also has another lesson he learned from his troubles in verse 5. And what is that? He says, when he looked back over his situation, when he looked back over his life, he realized it was not just that pit that God has saved him from. Indeed, David realized this, that his life has been one miracle after another miracle, one deliverance after another deliverance. And do you know what David realized? He said this. He says, God has multiplied two things, his deeds and his thoughts towards David. Let me explain. Every time I do something for anybody, it is because I've had that person in mind. So if, for example, I travel to Lagos, the only reason why I'll buy something for my children and for my wife is why? Because I had them in mind. I do not stop and buy something for the gate man of my estate. I'm sure he's a good man. But because I don't have any in mind, I don't remember to do any deeds for him. And this is what David is saying. The reason why we see the mercies of God over and over again in our lives, because God takes thought for us. God has us in his mind. God loves us and he's always thinking about us. And then we see the outworking of God's deeds in our lives, God's thoughts in our life in the deeds we see of God. And so you should be like David. You should, we should stop ever so often and take time to consider all the miracles and all the deeds and deliverances and all the things that God is doing in our lives. And then the only conclusion we will reach is like what David says in verse 5. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. None of us can ever tell one-tenth of what God has done in our life. Because the truth is we don't even know all that God is doing in our life. But whenever we stop and think, we will, we will say with the hymn writer, God doeth all things well. Now, I have an uncle who is a policeman, and he does something very strange. We used to do it before the man passed away. He had the man that helped him to become a policeman, that brought him into the police force, and every morning without fail, he would deliver to the man's house newspaper and cola nut every day. Maybe he forgot, maybe he didn't do it on Saturday and Sunday, but from Monday to Friday, every day, he was sent to that man, newspaper and colander, because the man was retired. And why was he doing that? That was his way of doing, saying what? Thank you to the man. Because all of us know that when someone has done so many things to us, so many good things for us, the only adequate response is to say thank you. And so David is teaching the people of Israel and say, God has done so much for us. And in verses 6 to 8, he wants to teach them, how do we say thank you to God for his blessings? But when we read verse 6 to 8, it doesn't add up because this is what David says. He says, in sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted. Bond offering and sin offering, you have not required. What does it mean? God in the law commanded for burnt offering and sin offering. God commanded for sacrifices and offering. So why is David saying God does not delight in sacrifice and offering? And you know the answer. The answer is found in 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15 was a story that David was not reading this story. David knew this story from personal experience. And it's, the background is the Amalekites, when the people of Israel were coming out of Egypt, had oppressed and attacked without provocation 
the people of Israel, attacking their rear guard and killing and wounding the weak who were struggling. And so God remembered them and he sent Saul to destroy the Amalekites. I'm going to read an extended portion of it and I want you to follow me as I read from 1 Samuel, I read from verse 10 to 23. 1 Samuel 15, I read from verse 10 to 23. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandment. And Samuel was angry and he cried to God all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And he was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ear, and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have bought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. Verse 17. And Samuel said, though you are lit in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have bought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Malachi to destruction. But the people took off the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight in burnt offering and sacrifice, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the father of Ram. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. What is going on in this story? Saul refuses to take responsibility. Because Saul says, I have obeyed the Lord. And why did he say he has obeyed the Lord? Because he has done substantially of what God commanded him. But Samuel kept insisting to him that you do not understand what it means to obey God. Obeying God does not mean obeying 90%. Obeying God means obeying him completely. You do not get to pick and choose what portions of God's commandment you obey. But you obey him completely. God sent Samuel to, God sent Saul to destroy the Amalekites, and he meant every single Amalekite, including their king, Agai. When you look at Nigeria today, what do you see? I do not think there's a country where people are sacrificial in their time, in their energy and their money as Nigeria. We have, in the last 50 years, I do not think any country has built 50% of the amount of churches we have raised in this country in the name of Jesus Christ. But the question we should ask ourselves, is that what God is looking for? Is God looking for church buildings? Is God looking for the things we've done? Or is God looking for obedience? And if God is looking for obedience, are we obedient? Let me say something else about sacrifice. Why are Nigerians so sacrificial? There is not uncommon for people to be in church from eight to five. It's not uncommon for people to give recklessly. It's not uncommon for people to spend their lives in service to God. And you need to ask yourself, why do we do this? Some of you might say, oh, it's because they expect something from God. And yes, some of it is because of that. But I think some of it is genuine. That people genuinely believe that God is pleased with these things. And people want to worship God. 
But the question we must always ask is, is this what God has required of us? Because if David is right, that what God is looking for is not sacrifices, it is not offering, it is something else, then we need to ask ourselves, do our lives as Nigerian Christians show that we understand what God is looking for, which we learned in First Samuel 15 is complete obedience. Do our lives show us as people that have taken time to study the word of God and to understand the word of God? Because if we give God sacrifice without obedience, God is going to say to us, as he said to Saul, that these are not the things I'm looking for. And so what is God looking for? We find the answer in verse 6. But David tells us that God is not looking for offerings and God is not looking for sacrifices. But what is God looking for? He says, you have given me an open ear. Now, if you're using the ESV, you're going to see that that is not what is written in Hebrew. You're going to have a footnote and the footnote is going to say to you, in Hebrew, what David wrote is, ears you have dug for me. That's literally what David wrote. Ears you have dug for me. What David is describing is a manual laborer digging a pit. So what does David mean? David means that one of the greatest mercies of what that God did for David was to dig him a hair. That means God dug through David's stubbornness. God dug through David's excuses. Dug, dug through David's foolishness. And God dug and dug and dug until David could hear the word of God. You see, the reason between David and Saul was not that David was a better man. It was that God was merciful to David and dug him a hair. And if you are here today, it is not because you are better than the people who are not here today. It is only because of the mercy of God for giving you an ear to understand and to hear. For many of us, we had many years when we read this thing, but we did not understand it. But one day, what happened? It was not because you suddenly got more intelligence or suddenly were able to see what you were not able to see before. It was because what? God was merciful to you. And like David, God dug a hair for you. And that is what we all sing in uh, songs of praise to God. Like John Newton say, was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear relieved. How precious is that grace of fear? There are a first believe. And so because God dug David an ear, look at what David says in verse 8. He says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. The reason why David could obey God was because the law of God was no longer something David read in the book, was something that David carried in his heart. And I like what one commentator says about this verse. When the law of God is written on our hearts, our duty will be our delight. Our duty will be our delight. And so, now that we've learned that what God desires for us is obedience, not necessarily sacrifice, there's nothing wrong with sacrifice, but it's obedience that leads to sacrifice that God is looking for. So what is the duties of the pilgrim? And that is what David wants to tell us from verse 9 to 10. What are the duties of a pilgrim? One of the duties that a pilgrim has, that David goes on to tell us, is the duty of evangelism, of proclaiming the goodness of God to other people. The reason why David was writing this letter, this psalm, the reason why David was telling the people of Israel, the reason why this is occurring is because David wants to tell the people about the mercies of God. He has learned of the deliverance of God and he wants to share it with people. God has saved him and David wants everyone to know what God has done for him. He wants to proclaim the mercies of God. And you and I also want to evangelize. But sometimes we find it hard to evangelize. And I think it's because too many times we've not defined what evangelism is. Evangelism is primarily telling people about the Jesus you've encountered. That is what evangelism is. It's first and foremost telling people what Jesus has done for you. And so, as, have you met Jesus? Then tell people what it means to mean Jesus. If you've met Jesus, you know what it means to have the joy of being forgiven. 
to tell people about what it means that when you wake up in the morning, when you think about what you've done, you know there's no longer any barrier between you and God. Because you are perfect? No, because God has shown mercy to you. Tell people of what it means, the joy of not being afraid that someone will find out something secret about you. That you don't have to have a password on your phone because your husband or your wife has nothing that they can find on your phone. Not because you are perfect, but because Jesus has changed your heart. Tell them about what it means that when you come to pray to God, you don't have to say, God, let's not talk about this area. Let's not talk about that area. But God, I just came for this one thing and another day we'll talk about that. Tell them about what it means that the fact that you and God can have a conversation about every part of your life and you are not afraid to go into the presence of God. And tell them what it means that you are not afraid of death. Not because you know what is on the other side, but because you know the person who has been on the other side. And you know that on that day is going to lead you by your hand and is going to take you there. Tell people about what God has done for you. Because that is exactly what David is telling the people of Israel. This is what God has done for me. And this is why I live my life in praise of God. And so far this psalm has been on a high note. But by the time we get to verse 11 to the end, it changes. Because all of a sudden, David starts complaining and starts lamenting. Evils, verse 12, evils have encompassed me. Iniquity have overtaken me, verse 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste to help me. And you start to get confused. Is this not a psalm of thanksgiving? Is David not already telling us about what God has done for him? And how God has delivered him? Yes and yes. But notice, a, a believer is a pilgrim in this world. And God will never make a pilgrim comfortable in this fallen world. No matter what stage of life you are in, if you are a child of God, and if you are a pilgrim, God will always send you reminders to poke you and make sure you are not comfortable in this life. Even if your own life is going well and everything is fine and you don't have prayer point, you are going to have loved ones who are going through something at every point in time. Some reason to cry out to God. Some reason to seek the face of God. Because God wants us, his children, to always be looking towards that heavenly city and never, ever get comfortable. So as David experienced, if you are a believer, you understand that even while you are thanking God for one salvation, you are coming to God and asking him to deliver you from something else. And that is exactly what David is talking about. And so what are the things we want God to deliver us from? David tells us of two categories in verse 12. The first one he tells us is, evil has encompassed me beyond number. That is all the troubles we face in this world. If you are in Nigeria, evils will encompass you beyond number from outside. It's just a corrupt, fallen country. And every day there's going to be a temptation and a trial that would be seeking to make you fall. But note what David tells us in verse 12. That the more important category, he tells us is what? My iniquities are overtaking me and I cannot see. David is telling us that for the Christian, we have troubles without and troubles within. But for the Christian, the always greater focus is on troubles within. And my mom goes to one of those churches. And there was a time in their church where one of the people that did, took the offering was found to be a Judas to be helping himself from the offering box. And so they took him to camp. <laughs> for deliverance. And I, and, I, and I thought to myself, I said, okay, when they bring this guy back from camp, are they going to put him back in charge of that box? I'm sure most likely no. And if you ask them why, they will say, yes, they believe that a demon has been cast out of him. But they don't want to take any chance. Now, you and I know this. Life is not as simple as what people make it seem. The troubles that we face are not something that external out to us. They are mainly internal to us. And David is telling us, this is how you know you are a mature believer. You start to see that your main problem is not your enemies without. Your main problem is your sin within. Look how David describes it. He says, my iniquities are overtaking me and I cannot see. 
They are more than the, num- than the hairs on my head. How many hairs do we have on our head? I looked it up. I didn't know myself. We have between 90,000 to 150,000 hairs on our head. Now, obviously, this is metaphorical. David does not literally mean he has 150,000 iniquities. But David is becoming to, beginning to realize this, that every time he looks into his heart, he finds more things that he needs God to help him with. He realizes that the depth of his iniquities are deeper than he thought. And that is what it means to be a mature believer. Think about it this way. The better your mirror, the more imperfections you will see on your face when you look into the mirror. The problem is not in the mirror. You should not break that mirror and go back to your old mirror. The problem is in your face. And so as, much, as we look upon the perfections on Christ, as you read more of Christ, as you meditate more on Christ, as you look more into the face of Christ, what do you see? You begin to see more of your own flaws. And that is why David is crying out to God, God, help me. I see my own imperfection. God, help me. And so David ends this psalm in verse 16 and 17 with a wonderful contrast. Look at what he tells us in verse 16 and 17. He tells us he's comparing God and himself. He says to us, he says, may all who seek you. That's the first thing a pilgrim must do, seek God. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. Now, if you are using any other translation apart from the ears, the most other translation translated as the Lord be magnified. And what David is saying is, this is the goal of worship, to magnify the Lord. Now, whenever you magnify something, what happens? Does that object increase? What is increasing? It's your perception of the object that is increasing. And so David is saying that the point of coming to worship God is that God will be magnified in your mind. And that is the rule. Every time you lift this building, ask yourself, is God magnified in my mind? And if yes, then you had a good time worshiping. If God is not magnified in your mind, then you have not worshiped him aright. And so David is telling us, we come to the Lord, to the place of worship to magnify God to make much of him, to see how great he is. And because of that, now you can understand what David says in verse 17. He says, as for me, I am poor and needy. Because David does not need to be a great person. You don't need to be a great man. David knows that if my God is great, and this God, he says, does what? Takes thought for me. Then it doesn't matter my condition because my God is great. And I go into the temple and I meditate upon the greatness of this God. And I cry out to him and I know that he shall be well with me. Now, if I end here, then I have not read this psalm as a Christian. Why? Because we Christians, we read the psalms and we understand the psalms differently from how David and the Old Testament believers do. Why? Because we have greater revelation this side of the cross. We understand something that David did not do. We understand that everything in the Old Testament is what? Is pointing where? To Christ. And so the question we must ask ourselves at this point is, in what way does Psalm 40 tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ? And we find the answers in Hebrews 10. So please turn with me to Hebrews 10 and see what the New Testament tells us about how to interpret Psalm 40. And I read Hebrews 10 from verse 5 to 7. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offering you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offering and sin offering, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written of me in the scroll of the book. What is going on here? The writer of Hebrews tells us that when Jesus came into this world, he took up the Psalter and he opened it to Psalm 40. And he said what? He said, This is written of me. And you start to ask yourself, what does this mean? This psalm is about David. I've just told you that it's about David's experience to teach the people of Israel. But yet when Jesus picked this psalm up, he said 
to the hearers that this psalm is written of me. So what exactly does the New Testament authors mean? This is what I mean. The psalm is of David. And the psalm is written of David. But David is the prophet. And David spoke better than he knew. And while in a sense the psalm is about the experiences of David, in a greater sense, the psalm is about the experience of the Messiah who would come from the line of David. And look again at Psalm 40 as we look at it through the lens of Christ. And all of a sudden you see that it's very different from what we thought it was. And so, for example, look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, David saying in verse 7 says, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book is written of me. What book is written of David? What scroll of the Bible tells us about David? Perhaps Deuteronomy. Because in Deuteronomy it says that there will be a king over Israel and the king should do X and Y. Perhaps that's what David meant. But when Jesus lifted up the Psalter and said, in the scrolls of the book is written of me, he was saying that all the entire Old Testament is written of him. He's telling us about him. And so Jesus is singing it in a way that David could not sing it. And when you look at verse 1, David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And sorry, when you look even at the title, it tells us that this song is dedicated to who? To the choir master, literally in the Hebrew, saying to the overseer of worship. And so Jesus comes as the overseer of the worship of God's people to lead the people of God into proper worship of God. I already told you that when Jesus was on earth, he sang the psalms with his disciples, teaching them how to worship God. And Jesus is still the overseer of worship today, teaching us how to understand the Psalms and how to sing the Psalms and how to pray the Psalms and how to lead the Psalms. And so when we follow Jesus as pilgrims, I already said to you, this Psalm, this psalm is a Psalm of pilgrimage, teaching us about how to worship God. And so David can be a guide to the people of Israel, but we have a better guide. And so we sing this Psalm with Jesus and we allow Jesus to teach us what it means to sing Psalm 40. And this is what Jesus says to us. David said he waited patiently on the Lord. And even though he was in a pit of destruction, God brought him out of that pit. And Jesus, in his earthly ministry, waited patiently upon the Lord. Early in the morning, he will rise and pray, crying upon God and waiting for God to deliver him. And even though Jesus was thrown into the grave and into hell, God delivered him from there and lifted him up to heaven and gave him a name that is above every name. David tells us that he was delighted to do the will of God. He tells us that he wanted to do the will of God. And indeed, we confess that David was one of the greatest men that ever lived. And David did the will of God more than most men. But you and I know this. David did not always do the will of God because he was a mortal man. But Christ told his disciples, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his word. David said, the law of God is hidden in my heart. Christ does more than that. Christ is the word of God. And Christ does the will of God perfectly. He obeyed his father from the first day to the last. And David tells us, he said, I preached to the great congregation. I did not hide your deliverance and your salvation. But Christ preached more than David ever preached. There has never been anybody that preached to as many people as Jesus did in the period of time he was in the earth. Every day he was literally preaching to thousands and tens of thousands of people. When you read the fact that he was feeding 5,000 people that came to hear him preaching, well, because he had preached them from morning to night and they were hungry and he could not send them away. Jesus was the one who was preaching the message of God's salvation to Jew and Gentile, to everyone who would listen. Nobody has ever preached as much as Jesus did about God's salvation. And David tells us that his iniquity has overtaken him. He ple so he pleaded to God for deliverance. But Jesus had no iniquities. But he took my iniquity. He took your iniquity. And he pleaded to God for our iniquities. And he drank the cup of God's judgment for our sakes to his dregs. 
On the cross, Jesus said, evil has encompassed me all around. But yet he looked to his father for deliverance. And for the sake of our sins, he bore them patiently. My brothers and sisters, this is what it means to sing this song as a pilgrim with Jesus as our choir master. And if you are listening to me here, and you do not understand these things, because you've never sang with Jesus this song, I invite you today to join the heavenly choir to join the church militant and to sing this song with Jesus. But if you are here and you are singing already, I invite you to sing on a higher note, to sing with Jesus what it means to be a worshiper. And this is what we sing, verse 5. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them. Yet, they are more than can be told. Amen. Help us, our Lord, to sing the song of Jesus. Help us, O Lord, to realize that everything in the Psalms and the Old Testament is to teach us about Christ. Help us, O Lord, to see Christ when we read your word. And Lord, take us beyond seeing. Take us to doing. Help us, O oh Lord, to walk after Christ in this our pilgrimage. As Christ suffered outside the city, help us to suffer for the sake of Christ. As Christ proclaimed your gospel to everyone he met, help us, O oh Lord, to proclaim your salvation in our lives. And as Christ, O oh Lord, always kept his eyes on the heavenly city, Help us to keep our eyes on your heavenly city and lead us, O oh Lord, in a way that leads to life. For in Jesus' name we pray.